So in today's video, we're going to go over a bunch of information for calculating the energy in a simple harmonic oscillator. Before I get started, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel, Step by Step Science. Get all my excellent physics, chemistry, and math videos. When I look at my YouTube analytics, I see that more than 90% of the people who watch my videos have not subscribed. Please subscribe. Click the notifications bell. Give me a thumbs up. Leave me a nice positive comment. And don't forget to share this video. In addition to that, I've made a bunch of other teaching and learning material, which you can find on my Teachers Pay Teachers website, whether you're looking for practice problems, simulations, examples with the solutions, notes. It's all there. The link is in the description below. And let's get started. I've made other videos, which you can link to in the upper right-hand corner of this video for this topic. But we're going to be talking about energy and a simple harmonic oscillator. And we talk about that. The energy in compressing or stretching a spring is mechanical energy. And that mechanical energy is made up of kinetic energy and potential energy. If we add the kinetic plus the potential, then we'll get the total mechanical energy. And if there's no friction in the system, then the total mechanical energy will remain constant. And as that mass on that spring oscillates back and forth, the energy will be continually converted from potential energy to kinetic energy, then from kinetic energy to potential energy. Now, in the first part of this video, we're going to come up with the terms for the kinetic energy, the potential energy, and the total mechanical energy. Now, the first one is pretty easy. It's the kinetic energy. The kinetic energy is simply 1 half mv squared. You should already be familiar with that equation for mechanical energy, in this case, kinetic energy. Now, in this video, we're also going to derive the terms for the potential energy and the term for the total mechanical energy. And we're going to start with the potential energy. Okay, so now for the potential energy, we have to remember we're talking about springs, so we're going to have elastic potential energies, not gravitational potential energy. But when you stretch or compress the spring, you're going to be doing work. Because in order to stretch or compress the spring, you're going to be have to apply a force to the spring, and you're going to have to apply that force through some distance. And that is how we calculate work. The work is simply the force that you apply times the distance through which that force is applied. Also, when you do work on a system, in this case a spring, you're going to be giving that spring some potential energy. The amount of work that you do is going to be equal to the amount of potential energy that you give the spring. Therefore, we can also calculate the potential energy simply as F times D. So, the potential energy is going to be equal to k times x. k is the spring constant times x, the change in length of the spring. That's how we calculate the amount of force needed to stretch a spring. It's k, the spring constant, times x. If you're not familiar with the spring constant is, of course, in the upper right-hand corner, you can link to the video where I explain what the spring constant is. So the potential energy is k times x times the distance that the spring is stretched. And we can simplify that as to the PE is equal to K times X squared. Now, that is not quite the equation for the potential energy, so please don't write it down. Because if we were to look at a graph of the force applied to the spring with respect to the distance, we would see that the force that we would be applying is not a constant force. The area under that curve is the amount of work that we'd be doing. So we're going to calculate the area under this curve. Now, you'll notice that this is a triangle. And a triangle has the area of 1 half the base times the height. The base of this triangle is x. The height is f. So we can substitute those values in. And we get that the area is 1 half the base times the height. Well, the force, once again, is just k, the spring constant, times x. X here is the change in length also. This is the same X, the change in the length. And we can simplify that equation for the area as 1 half KX squared because this is a triangle. So you should remember that the potential energy is the work under the curve and the area under the curve is 1 half KX squared and that this term over here is not for the potential energy, but this is the term 
that we use to calculate the potential energy for elastic potential energy. Okay, now we can go back and we can substitute that into our equation we had. You can see here we had the kinetic energy was one half mv squared. Now we have a term for the potential energy and that is one half k x squared, k being the spring constant. Okay, now we can go on and we can derive the term for the total mechanical energy. The first thing you need to know is that at the point of greatest displacement of the mass, the mass is going to stop for just a moment, right? It's going to stop before it goes back in the other direction. When it stops for just a moment, it's at its greatest displacement, and all of the energy in the spring is going to be stored as potential energy. It's not going to have any kinetic energy because it stops, and it's going to have no velocity and no kinetic energy. Therefore, all of the energy of the spring is stored as potential energy. Now, you'll remember we calculate the potential energy of the spring as 1 half kx squared. But at the point of greatest displacement, or that means that at the point of greatest displacement, when all of the energy is potential energy, that the total mechanical energy is going to be equal to the potential energy of the spring. All potential, no kinetic. Now, at the point of greatest displacement, we give that point the name amplitude, which has the symbol A. That means if we want to calculate the total mechanical energy at the point of greatest displacement, which we call the amplitude, we can substitute the amplitude in here for x. And that means that the equation for the total mechanical energy is simply 1 half Ka squared. All right, all potential, no kinetic, the total is equal to a potential at the amplitude. Now we can substitute that term back into our equation, and then we know the total mechanical energy is 1 half Ka squared, and that means we now have a nice equation that we can use to calculate the energy in a simple harmonic oscillator. We have a term now that we derived for the total mechanical energy, we have our kinetic energy, excuse me, yes, kinetic energy, and we also derive this equation for the potential energy. And I also want to point out that that means that the total mechanical energy is proportional to the square of the amplitude. Now, in the next part of the video, we're going to go over some specifics for the amplitude and the equilibrium position. Okay, so here we go. We have three different diagrams for our simple harmonic oscillator. And the idea is that we have a mass attached to a spring, and it's oscillating back and forth between position number one and position number two. And each time it goes from one position to the other, it goes through the equilibrium position right here. And we're going to go over some specific information that you should be aware of for each of those three positions. We're going to start here right in the middle. You might call that position zero because the displacement is zero. And when the displacement is zero right there in the middle, we call that the equilibrium position. Now, when the mass has its greatest, the spring has its greatest extension, and the mass is right here, we call that amplitude. And you call that the positive amplitude. The other one, when it's at its maximum compression, you could call that the negative amplitude. Now, at position number one, the mass has its greatest extension, x is at its maximum, and therefore the potential energy is at its maximum. When it reaches its maximum extension at the amplitude, then the mass is not moving before it goes back in the other direction, and therefore the kinetic energy is zero. So at this location, we have maximum potential energy. All the energy is stored as potential energy and has no kinetic energy. Also at this location, the acceleration is at its maximum because it's changing direction. Now, when it goes back through the equilibrium position, it's back at x equals zero, and if there's no displacement, then there's no potential energy because potential energy is one-half kx squared. Well, where did all that energy go? It went into the object's kinetic energy because now when it goes through the equilibrium position, it's at its maximum velocity, and all the energy in the spring is stored as kinetic energy. Also at that location, the acceleration is zero. So you can see we go from here where we have maximum potential and no kinetic, then we convert all that potential to kinetic and we have no potential at this location at the equilibrium. Now on the other side, for the other amplitude, it's a similar situation. We have maximum extension, maximum potential, no velocity, no kinetic, and therefore 
the acceleration is at its maximum because it's now it's going to be changing directions and going back in the other direction. Okay, so now let's just summarize what we saw in that previous slide. Remember, at that maximum displacement, the velocity of the mass is zero because it comes to a rest before it goes back in the opposite direction, so it has no kinetic energy, but the mass is at its maximum displacement, so therefore we can calculate the energy in the system as one half Ka squared, A being the amplitude, all the energy in the system is stored as potential energy. When the mass goes back to the equilibrium position, then the displacement is zero and the mass has no potential energy and the mass is at its maximum velocity and therefore all of the energy in that system is in the form of kinetic energy so we can calculate the total energy of the system as just energy equals one half mv squared v being the maximum velocity as it goes back through the equilibrium position. Okay, now we're going to go through a couple uh, derivation for some equations that we can use for some further calculations and the first thing that we're going to calculate is the maximum velocity and that is this v right here. Now the maximum velocity occurs, you need to remember, at the equilibrium position. As the mass goes back through that equilibrium position, then it will be moving with the maximum velocity. So from this equation, our general equation, we want to solve for v squared. Now remember also at the equilibrium position, the displacement is zero, so there's no potential energy. So this is the potential energy term, and that means that term is zero. And now we have simplified our equation one step like that already. And you can see we have a one-half on both sides of the equation. So we can cancel those one-halves, and then we're left with Ka squared, the spring constant, times the amplitude squared is equal to the mass times the velocity. And this is our maximum velocity because we said it occurs when the potential energy is zero. So we want to solve for v here. The next thing we're going to do is divide both sides of the equation by m, and we get v squared is equal to ka squared over m. Now we're going to take the square root of both sides to get rid of the v squared, and then we're left with v, and now remember, this is the maximum velocity. Now we're going to take the square root of this term. We've got to take the square root of each of these, and we've got to take the square root of k over m, and that's equal to the square root of k over m, and then that is just times a, because when we take the square root of a squared, the amplitude squared, we're just left with a. So the maximum velocity, which occurs at the equilibrium position, is simply the square root of k over m, the spring constant, divided by the mass times the amplitude. Okay, now we can go through and derive a more general equation for the velocity at any of the inter intermediate points as the mass oscillates back and forth between those two positions and through the equilibrium position. Okay, once again, we're going to solve here for v squared. But in this case, the potential energy is not zero, so we cannot eliminate any of these terms. So we can simply cancel all of the one-halves. We can multiply by two. There's a one-half in front of each of those terms. So those all cancel. So then we're left with this remaining equation. Now, once again, we want to solve for the V. We have plus kx squared, so we're going to subtract kx squared, the spring constant and the displacement squared from both sides of the equation, and we end up with mv squared is equal to ka squared minus kx squared. And once again, we want to solve for the v, so we are going to now divide both sides of that equation by m, and then we get v squared is equal to k over m times a squared minus k over m times x squared. Now the next thing we're going to do, we're going to just solve for v, but we're going to do two things. We're going to factor out the km, the k over m in each of those terms, and then we're also going to take the square root of both sides of the equation so we don't have v squared and we just have v. And then we do that, we get that the velocity at any point of the travel of the mass back and forth as it oscillates back and forth is simply the square root of k over m, because you see we factored out the k over m from both terms, and then we took the square root, so we have k over m then we have times a squared, here's a squared minus x squared, just like that. So that is the equation that we can use to calculate the velocity for that um, mass as it oscillates back and forth. Now we're going to do one more thing. We're going to get the acceleration. So we're going to calculate the acceleration, and we're going to come up with the drive the equation for the acceleration of the mass. And in order to do that, we're going to use Newton's second law, which is F equals M. And we're going to rearrange that for the acceleration. The acceleration is therefore equal to F divided by M. Now we're talking about elastic energy or the elastic spring. And the force 
that is needed to extend or compress the spring is simply F is equal to K times X. That's Hooke's law. We can substitute that into our equation for the acceleration, and then we typically write that as we have with the previous equations. We factor out the X, because that's really our only variable for any particular spring. K is constant, and the mass is usually constant that we have on the spring. So the acceleration is equal to K over M times x. Now we can also get the maximum acceleration. We have to have remember that the maximum acceleration occurs at the amplitude. So if we substitute the amplitude in for x, then we get that the maximum acceleration is simply k over m times a, just like that. Okay, so those are the equations we have for the velocity, uh, the maximum velocity and the intermediate velocity, and then for the acceleration and the maximum acceleration. Okay, so there you go. We did a lot of stuff in that video. I hope you found that video helpful. If you did, please do all of the following five things. You should subscribe to my channel, click on the notifications bell, give me a thumbs up, leave me a comment in the comment section below, and don't forget sharing is caring. Share this video with all of your friends. Show them just how much you care. Thank you so much for watching. We will see you in the next video.